The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Actually, the message for today is another gospel. Another gospel. And this is not going to be complicated on all the heresies that went through the church. Uh, It's going to be simply an easy way to let the Holy Spirit evaluate in your life if you're truly a a life message of the gospel of Jesus. Right? Because the message is not just preached. It's to be demonstrated. And so I want to cover some things that we can really just get into a place of a good cleansing service so that we can start fresh in the love of God. And the discipline that comes from God always has love built in it. And I, I, I don't know, I just, I was never afraid of discipline of the Holy Spirit because I could always feel the love of God even in a corrective word. And, and it was beautiful. As a matter of fact, when we were taught to prophesy, that's how we were taught, weren't we? We, we to uh, enter into third level prophecy as they called it back then, we had to be able to prophesy a corrective word with so much grace and love that the person would want to take you out to dinner after they got a corrective word. A lot of you never got words like that. You got the, what's wrong with you, and they call that prophecy. What's wrong with you, you know, avoid that kind. That's not, that's not a prophetic. It's comfort, edify, and encourage. And if, you, and if there's something wrong, you know, I always use the illustration of... Uh, of uh, uh, the one time I prophesied to Jennifer and realized it was a, it was a corrective word and it was uh, on trust. And it was like going through shaky transitions, traveling ministry, never knowing the beginning from the end, never knowing what was coming next. And I can remember, I would use it as an illustration, but at that time it was really ministered to her and I saw this courageous line of Judah rise up as a result. But it was basically, you know, uh, I just hear the Lord saying to you, Jennifer, that God is basically moving you with cords of love toward himself to bring you into a greater and more implicit trust. He is going to establish you. He's going to remove the cobwebs of fear and doubt and unbelief, and he's going to cause you to be a torch that's on fire. You're going to carry that fire, and you're going to be with, but you are going to enter into a rootedness and a groundedness uh, that is supremely, supremely deeper than anything you've known before. You're going to be... uh, uh, like a peg fastened in a, in a sure place. Technically, that's a corrective word. It was basically dealing with lack of trust. And it was fortifying, look to me for your trust, and I'll direct your path. That's the way a corrective word should be. I don't hear that in the prophetic very much, uh, quite frankly. It's always what's wrong with you. And uh, heck, I could be in the world and have people tell you what's wrong with you. And so far, I've never seen anybody die of too much encouragement. Have you? Have you ever seen anybody get so much encouragement, edification, and comfort that they actually just went to pieces? I doubt it. Uh, So, anyway. But I believe that we're in a time of preparation. And uh, it's going to be the simplicity that's in the gospel, but it's also going to have to be God... uh, Teach me to be sensitive enough to see if I've gone off track into another gospel. Mm-hmm. And here's, here's where I want to begin. Galatians 1.6. I am so surprised, this is Paul speaking to the Galatians, I am so surprised and astonished that you so quickly turn, that you are turning renegade and deserting him who invited and called you by grace, the grace of Christ the Messiah, and that you are transferring your allegiance to a different gospel or even a opposition gospel. And basically what I saw was that this gospel is supposed to be a life message. And every place that you're accustomed to doing things in the name of Jesus, when I was in the school of the Spirit as a baby Christian, God had me change that word name of Jesus to nature of Jesus. In other words, every time I would say to do something in the name of Jesus, it better be in the 
nature of Jesus or you're just going through dead religion. Remember the seven sons of Sceva tried to use the name of Jesus? Didn't work for them, did it? Doesn't work in the flesh. The name of Jesus must have the nature of Jesus. Every spirit's name matches its nature. And God is basically saying that to go to another gospel, I'm looking for a manifestation of the gospel or a life message, not an imitation of the gospel. A manifestation of the gospel, not an imitation. And Paul basically said in Galatians uh, 1.16, he said, for this reason I was taken from my mother's womb that I would listen to this order to reveal his son in me that I might preach. Was he called to preach? Yes. But what was he called to preach? First, that he would reveal his son in me. God called me to reveal his son in me that I might preach. There's a difference between preaching from the nature and preaching as an echo. God wanted you to be the voice of anointing. But it's going to be God's voice, God's nature that you're speaking through. You're not just repeating something you heard somebody say. Unless you owned it and it changed your life. If it changed your life, then you own it. And then you are manifesting it through that. But here's uh, the place I want to start. And basically, God, uh, in traveling ministry, it seemed like we always had to start here. And that is um, in John 20... Verse 23, now having received the Holy Spirit and directed by him, preach the forgiveness of sin. In other words, as the Father has sent me, I send you. What did he send him to do? To preach repentance and the omission or the remission of sin. Go preach forgiveness, if you want to put it real simple. And this is what the Lord showed me. Step one of preaching another gospel is if you are preaching a gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross and forgives your sin, and you don't receive that gift, then you don't get it, do you? But if you receive it, you own it. You receive the remission of sin. You receive the forgiveness. But it says if you receive forgiveness, you should be the most forgiving people on the face of planet Earth. And if so, if you're going to go preach the gospel and you're not a forgiver, you're preaching another gospel. Did you hear what I just said? You walk in unforgiveness as a believer, but you think you're helping people with the gospel, you're preaching out of two sides of your mouth because unless you're walking in a lifestyle of forgiveness, you're preaching a, a message that you're not living. Forgiveness was meant to be a continuous flow uh, Continuous flow. Repentance was meant to be a continuous flow. It was meant to be a lifestyle or a river. Our next book is going to be The Will of God is a River, unless they change the title. Uh, <laughs> but understanding flow and understanding what interrupts flow. And I, I, I really saw that, that forgiveness in John 20 and Luke uh, 24. Basically, the message was the same. It was written in this message that he would be proclaimed with authority in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem, that there's forgiveness of sins and repent. Some read that uh, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. But Jesus is the forgiver. What it's basically saying, you deliver that message. Some will receive it and some won't. You're not the forgiver. Jesus is the forgiver in you. You cooperate. Your part is to allow that forgiver to flow by grace out to other people. As, he, as you received him, so give. But it needs to be a constant. Now, when forgiveness flows, if you're going to be preaching this gospel of the kingdom, then forgiveness has to flow toward you as well as others. If you can't forgive yourself, you're in another gospel. It's a gift. You're saved by grace through faith. It's a gift. This is not of anything that you would do. 
And so I see that it's another gospel if you won't walk in a lifestyle of forgiveness. If you're holding it against anybody right now and you want to believe for, for an increased anointing, you want to see the power of God, you want to see the blessings of God in your life, you, if you don't start there, you're on another gospel. Forgiveness is an absolute essential life flow. And if you think you can harbor that, I've even, we used to run into people who even say things like, well, when they repent, then I'll forgive them. No, I'm sorry, it's got to be unilateral. Uh, until they repent, you can't have reconciliation, but reconciliation is not forgiveness. Forgiveness is one way. Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. They didn't repent at that point in time, but it flowed from the heart of Jesus and it was a gift to them whether they received it or not. That's your obligation. Some will receive it. If they receive it, there's a chance for reconciliation. But there's no reconciliation until they repent of the behavior that broke the relationship. There has to be a genuine repentance. I've seen people almost reconcile. Had a case where they said, well, you know, uh, had one say it to me once, well, uh, Pastor, I know you love me and I love you, so everything's going to go. No, not, no, no. You, f you haven't repented of what you did. You've never verbalized it. You want to just sweep it under the rug. That's not reconciliation. It takes humility to reconcile. It takes humility to honor God and his gospel. So forgiveness, no forgiveness. You know, James 4 says, to know to do and not to do, that's sin. And you know to forgive, don't you? This is, you don't need a word from the Lord. But what we found that was beneficial into restoring health to people's lives was that they were trying to forgive. Did you ever try to forgive and not feel like it's working? Because you were doing it wrong. God didn't make it difficult. Matter of fact, forgiveness is instant. Reconciliation can take some time, all right? People need to prove themselves, reestablish trust. But nonetheless, forgiveness is instant. But if you don't forgive from the heart, and that was the key. Literally, literally saw tremendous lives changed when we traveled church to church, just teaching people how to forgive from the heart instead of the head. They were sincere, they meant well, but it wasn't producing. Some people, even when I married Jennifer, with all her degrees, she basically said, I've been trying to forgive somebody for two years now. <laughs> I'm going, that's not supposed to happen. Forgive someone for two years? You're trying to do it, apparently. Something that God himself will do in you and through you, for it is God who is at work to will and to do. Your job is to open the door of your heart, to will and yield to the grace of God. Amen. All right? So that's one way you could be living in another gospel, no matter how stable and Christ-like you think you are. If you don't walk in a lifestyle of forgiveness, that's another gospel. Another gospel also is Matthew 14, the gospel of what we could call cold love. It's basically that many will be offended and will betray one another, and they will hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. For he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Hmm. And actually, one of the ways you can feel cold love is in correction. I used to watch this. People would go, and you've heard this, you may have said this yourself. I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just speaking the truth. And I always go, where's the redemption in your truth? Very often there's no redemptive solution. It's just straightening you out because you're irritating me. So cold love is basically found in correction. You can find out in correction, even if it comes in the form of prophecy. If it, correction doesn't have a redemptive solution, I say, where's the love? Where's the redemption? Redemption is the name of the game and it's never changed. Somehow it should, it should be pulling you toward him, not away from him. He's not casting you aside. He's basically, if there's correction, it's so that things will go well with you. 
honor your mother and father that things might go well. That's always the intent of any instruction that he gives. It's not, it's not just because he just loves instruction, rules, and regulations. So Father, if we're not walking in a lifestyle of forgiveness, and don't do what we saw when we traveled. We used to do primarily, we'd minister to uh, the church staff. No matter what church we went to, we'd minister to the staff. And occasionally you'd always get someone on staff who feels pretty special, because they're on staff. And they would say, I don't have anybody to forgive. But it was always so cool to have the husband sitting right there and the woman say, I don't need to forgive anybody because she's think off the top of her head, she's probably being honest, I can't think of it. And the husband goes, oh yeah, what about the neighbor when they didn't return the wheelbarrow? What about your kids when they didn't come for Thanksgiving dinner? And next thing you know, she's manifesting all kinds of unforgiveness. <laughs> so don't think you don't have anyone to forgive. We're not asking you, we're asking you to ask God to search me, oh God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. What's Jennifer got? 2,000 thought patterns up here? 2,000 brain processes every second, and you're probably wasting most of them with, I'm hungry, I'm tired, how long is this sermon going to be, you know. Conscious. Conscious. But non-conscious, non-conscious, 400 billion down here. So you want to know if there's something with you, you ask God to search you, and you quit searching you. You'll come up to silly conclusions. God will... David said, search me for secret sin. Who were they secret from? David! That's the better response. Oh God, if there's something in me, show me. Hmm. Cold love is another gospel. Here's another one. Without lordship. I'm not talking about Jesus being your Savior. If you're born again, He's your Savior. I'm talking about Lordship. Most of our material was written to teach people how to keep Him as Lord, not just your Savior. Because what we saw is there are many people who have been, they remind me of the guys in the factory who had 30 years seniority, but they had about one year's experience. Jesus can live a confined, restricted life on the inside of you if you haven't learned to walk in His Lordship. He's your savior, yeah, but you're pretty, much, you're pretty much boss of your own life and he's in there confined and restricted, would love to get out and bless people, but you're in the way because you're doing it your way. Jennifer used to have a beautiful illustration. God gave her a visual once where she was riding in the back seat of this limousine and the longer she stayed in the limousine, Jesus was driving. And the longer Jesus was driving, the more it accelerated and you were going places because he was the driver. But every now and then, something would catch her eye out the window, and she'd have him stop, and she'd go smell the flowers and walk away. And Jesus would very patiently sit behind the wheel, like, when you're done with your distractions, you can get back in, and we can speed down the road. Or, you know, you can take as long as you want. You're not going to make me go any faster, but you can certainly slow me down. Isn't that a good illustration? All right. So basically, lordship means stay under his authority because it says here in Luke 6.46, now the, all of these warnings, by the way, of forgiveness, unless you forgive from the heart, every last little thing, all of these things are to believers. This is not to unbelievers now. And here's another one, without lordship, Luke 6.46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I'm telling you to do? That's a good question, isn't it? Does that apply to any of us here? Lord, Lord, why do you not do? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why do you call me Lord, but I'm not Lord? Is what he's saying. Lack of obedience. The word which God sent to the children of Israel peach, preached peace through Jesus and that he would be Lord of all. I always remember God was when in the school of the Spirit. He was taking me to, I, he used to use in the Amplified Bible, Psalm 40, verse 6. And he said it very simply. And this is for every believer. I've given you a capacity to hear and obey. And that removes all your excuses. If you say, but I'm not hearing God. 
Well, you've got a capacity here in God. God's not trying to hide from you. You must be off on your own thoughts, plans, and agendas. Because basically, he says, he, my sheep have, hear my voice. Maybe you're a little bit of a goat right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're getting, anyway, maybe you think you got a better idea. You can't have the kingdom without the king. <laughs> Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. Righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Under the new covenant, his righteousness is love and action. Seek first his rule and his love. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected by him. And this we know that we are in him. 2 Corinthians 11. I fear... This is to the Corinthian church, obviously. I fear lest somehow, the serp, as the serpent has deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preached another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you have received a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which we have not accepted, why do you put up with it? Remember, remember that lady that was so afraid she was going to damage our church? She was such a precious woman. She came and she said, if I come to this church, she just got kicked out of a large church for being flaky. And she came, if I come to your church, I'm going to destroy it. And I said, no, you're not. Tell me what's going on. And Jennifer, you gave her homework for one week, homework. If it doesn't sound like Jesus, say that's not me. She was a missionary's daughter. Don't accept those thoughts. Don't accept those thoughts. We have a responsibility to accept and reject. From salvation through sanctification, accept, reject, accept, reject. Personal responsibility is literally taking it upon yourself to know if it's not scriptural, I reject it. But without lordship, you know, there's just a lack of commitment to lordship. And, and really, we, we've been uh, uh, preparing for our next book on the will of God as a river. And one of the things we see that uh, is causing problems is a lack of commitment. Uh, is there's too many choices nowadays for people. Uh, and Jeremiah talked about scattered charms. I love Jesus, but I have to have my hobby, my entertainment, which by the way, in this generation, this current time we're living in, amusement and entertainment has become a god. Is it evil in and of itself? No. But can you make anything a god? Yes. And right now, people's spare time has become a idolatrous. You can travel all over the world and never and find it exciting and never accomplish anything for the kingdom. Not everybody that travels overseas is a missionary. Not everyone that says they are a missionary are doing mission work. It's a vacation. Mishication. But right now, if there was a need to repent of something, to prepare us for the days ahead, and for truly a good outpouring of the Spirit, we're going to have to start making some choices that Jesus is first and let the other choices fall in line. Not equal. Not, I love Jesus, but I love my car, my boat, my vacation, my this, my that, my that. Those things are not bad in and of themselves. But if it's robbing you from Jesus, then perhaps you're, you've got what they call in Jeremiah, scattered charms. You love everything. You love too many things. But remember the Ephesian church that was so mature? How did they get rebuked by John in the book of Revelation? You lost your first love. So you can say you love Jesus, 
but you could have basically even considered yourself mature and lost first love. So it's getting back to the first things. And so without forgiveness, with a coldness to your love, with a lack of lordship, all of these things could lead you into another gospel. The next thing it could lead you into is without intimacy. We don't have a book that we don't haven't stressed that over and over and over again. And I'm, I fear that people think intimacy with God is a waste of time, that they've got things to do. It goes back to being too many choices, too busy. And not only that, but you isolate yourself. Everyone that's ever really grown has had healthy relationships around them. Whenever you isolate yourself to figure things out, you will come up with ridiculous conclusions. Isolation is where the enemy has a field day. Just like Amalek would attack the children of Israel, who did he attack? The stragglers. People that isolate are more vulnerable. Wild animals attract the weak and the stragglers. They're a better target. Without intimacy, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The gifts and the callings are without repentance, but basically what he's saying is that you operated in the gifts and the callings, but you pretty much were in charge of your own life. Intimacy with me would have had you in union and communion. You would have been doing you would have been doing out of relationship, not out of activity. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Without intimacy, listen to this, uh, 1 Corinthians 8.3, but if somebody really loves God truly, that is with affectionate, prompt obedience and grateful recognition of his blessing, he is known by God recognized as worthy of his intimacy and love, and he is owned by God. If that strikes fear in you, you've got some real serious issues. I want to be owned by God. Do you? Or do you want what you want when you want it? Because that'll be the battle between the flesh and lordship. And intimacy, you find that satisfaction. Intimacy... I still say we're going to need to do a book just on what I experienced in relationship to intimacy with God. Even my peers said, Dennis, all you do is pray and you're silent and you're a mystic and everything. But I saw a lot of activity that, quite frankly, wasn't doing anything. Oh, I'm getting there. Where's there? A lot of times you'd ask them, where's there if you're getting there? You're busy, but you don't know where you're going or what you're doing. You're just busy. I'm not against busy, but I want to be in the works of God. I want to be the God story, not my story, trying to find something. Because you can go in circles for a long time and look busy. But basically what God was telling me, and here's this, if you ever took this slowly, it would change your life. From here, Jesus in you, not heaven, in you. If you would learn to touch him and be aware Aware that you are touching spirit to spirit. How many know when you're touching him spirit to spirit? How many live up here so much you don't even know when you are touching him spirit to spirit? For me, this is a constant regardless of what's going on up here. It's not drop down, it's stay down. It's cut the cord, abide. Practice the presence 24-7. So you touch him. If it really means something to you, you know what you will do? you will stay there until it's an embrace. I'll tell you what, I could kiss Jennifer good morning intermittently throughout the day, and that'd be nice. But I would rather that kiss went to an embrace. And if I embraced her and hugged her on a regular basis, sometimes you could just hug her forever. I'm talking natural relationship. But if you brought that into the kingdom, you need to move that touch to an embrace. And that's what the Lord taught me. You're not wasting time in that touch. You're increasing the dimension of touch to move from intermittent to a more constant embrace. 
And I noticed that God would say, any truth that I give you, Dennis, document that truth and then look for the fruit in your life so that you're not living in la-la land. I want to see transformation. And I saw that the touch led to a, an embrace that becomes an addictive want to to where you're no longer satisfied with intermittent. You want an embrace. You want to abide. The lost art of abiding in John 15 is really what it amounts to. So I'm abiding in that embrace, and guess what happens? You embrace long enough. You override all of your fleshly wants, desires, entertainment, and everything that you think you need to fill your life with, and you find a supernatural satisfaction that can be found nowhere else other than in Jesus. And then it gets better. From that place of satisfaction, your focus toward life, your orientation is changed to where you've got rich satisfaction found only in Jesus. Your focus is a healthy others. What can I give of life to other people? Their needs are more important than my own. It isn't... And it's not coming from a need to be seen and heard. It's not coming from a need to be used. It's coming out of a satisfaction and an overflow. And then God showed me, you know what that overflow does? It points to overflowing love. It flows to fulfilling the gospel message of the love commandment, which is walking even in constant forgiveness. That is the love message, where the rubber meets the road. But it's the abounding love I found in Philippians. Let your love overflow or abound. How do you do that? Well, if you're not in an intimate relationship, you don't know how to abound in love. You'll come up with some fleshly good deed to do out of your guilt. He's talking out of that rich satisfaction, out of that no-so give. You're giving out of substance. You're giving out of experience. Then that overflowing love, what does it do? It points you to the Father. It points you to the Father. I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear my Father saying. It's basically pointing you to others, but out of obedience to the Father and out of your pointing to the heart of the Father. Is that the heart of the Father? Others? God so loved the world that He gave? Is that the heart of the Father? All of a sudden, you're moving in the heart of the Father, but guess what it's going to do? It's going to point you to the heart of the Father, but the heart of the Father then is going to become, you're going to become a partaker of that divine nature, and your passion and your desire is to bring many sons unto glory. Now let's look at the big picture, the, the, the macro. John basically demonstrated this the best because he said, he who was from the beginning, the eternal father. He was a father before he was a creator and a miracle worker. He was a father. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And where, Father, I pray that they would be one even as you and I are one so that the world may believe and that to bring many sons unto glory. Jesus was the firstborn among brethren so the will of the Father is to bring many sons unto glory. That's our responsibility. But out of intimacy, without intimacy, you can't do that. You're going to find some religious way to do it. You can go out and win some souls and not necessarily, you know, you reproduce according to kind. Did you ever go, to, how many of you have gone on a foreign mission and you saw a group of people from Kenya act just like the Baptists in Indiana? They reproduced according to their kind. Not necessarily the love of God, but a lot of the religion, a lot of the trappings, right? You can tell by the way they preach and what they say. You can tell who basically discipled them. You are supposed to reproduce according to kind, but the kind that really is necessary are the ones that bring sons and daughters. I just loved it with a, a, a friend of ours, basically uh, is a medical doctor, and he came from... Uh, what country? Nigeria. Nigeria. And he says, I'm looking for a church when I go to the United States. And his spiritual father, and this is what I had in my life, I had spiritual fathers. 
he basically said, I was always the youngest one. He said, don't look for a church. Look for a father. That man loved him. But he loved him with a maturity beyond the average pastor who's trying to get numbers, trying to get notches on the gun or whatever. God's basically saying, without intimacy, to fulfill what God intended for all of us to do is to grow up. By the way, I still remember uh, Prophet Denny, remember? Not this one. We, he had a young man about 20 years old following around. Denny, Denny, Denny. Then he was prophesying to 1,000 people. <laughs> and he's going, Denny, Denny, I want to increase my anointing too. I want to increase my anointing too. And he could, finally, I think he got a little tired of hearing, hearing him. He said, you want to increase your anointing? Get a job. <laughs> Leave mommy and daddy's house. Get married, have kids, and you'll increase your anointing. <laughs> you know that that's part of coming into your calling is growing up. Adulthood, we have adult adolescence. Adult adolescence, adult bodies chronologically with an adolescent mindset. Oh, I'm going to touch on some sacred cows here, but I don't know if I should go there or not. Go there? All right, somebody on Ustream needs this one. As far as I'm concerned, reproduce according to kind. You were born to reproduce. Some people have kids for the wrong reasons. Some people don't have children for the wrong reason. If you say, well, God's not telling me to have children, fine, I can buy that. Are you, do you have spiritual children? Because if you don't have spiritual children and you don't have children, there's something in your attitude that's still all about you. You're single or married. Does God have everybody get married? No. But I've ran into many people who are using it as an excuse. I'm single. I don't feel God wants me to get married. You're a self-absorbed single person. Ooh, we can get a repentance right now. Actually, they're going to start throwing stuff at me if I keep this up. Could you possibly be a self-absorbed single person? No. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you could. You could be a self-absorbed married person. Huh? It's the motive. It's the motive. But basically, what we saw was that adulthood now, I want to mess with the ones I feel like you're called for ministry because that's a small percentage. But there's people watching on Ustream that, that feel like I'm called to full-time ministry. A very small percentage are called to the full-time ministry. Everybody's a minister in the marketplace. But step number one for your full-time ministry is leave home. <laughs> if you're still living with mommy and daddy, you're not ready yet. You don't even understand life. Finish school. This is not rocket science. This is something you're called a ministry. Become financially independent or get a job. Not, not go fund me. No, no, no. Get a job. Please fund my ministry. I have people that wanted people to support their ministry, but they never tithe. And I'm thinking, by what principle are you going to be supported? You weren't faithful in your own giving. Why would God just bless you with finances? It's, it's bizarre. We need, if you're seeing little fruit, there's probably little faithfulness. That's the missing ingredient in this generation. Faithfulness is far and wide. And if you can't be faithful with the little things, Everything God blessed me with, and he blessed me, multi-million dollar facilities, gas wells on my church property, oil wells on my, strike it, we struck it oil and struck 
gas and struck all kinds of blessing. I turned a whole neighborhood with my first church, basically increased the home's value in an entire neighborhood because of, of how I fixed up a, a deserted 11 acres and turned it into a beautiful, uh, beautiful multi-million dollar facility. And God blessed everything I put my hand to. I had business experts say that you can't do that in five years. I did it in five years. But that was God's instruction. All I did was obey. Get married. Have kids. If there's any selfishness in you, you have a child, and it's all of a sudden it's no longer all about you. And right now, you've got pagans outnumbering you with children than you have Christians, reproducing according to their kind. All right, so I'm not going to hammer away on you having children, but I am going to hammer away on this. You should have spiritual children if you don't have natural children. If you don't have either, there's something seriously wrong with your walk with the Lord because you are called to go ye and make disciples. Not converts, disciples. Ministers. Here's the other problem that I see. When people are going to cry legalism. But I'll tell you what, I would rather err, uh, not err on the side of legal, I'd rather err on the side of discipline and relationship. Because I've seen ministries without relationship, and they're just a beautiful form without, without, the, without the influence of the relationship that is necessary. Here it is. Full, you call the full-time ministry? Problem number one. No confirmation from the home church. They're just renegades, lone rangers, self-appointed. No confirmation from the home church. I was a baby, baby Christian in a church of a thousand, and God told me, do not let that man know you exist, but you serve him. Today, we have people who want to be leaders, but don't serve. He said, you served that man. I carried block because I didn't have much in the way of skill. <laughs> so I carried block for his new building. And you know what's funny? The day came shortly after that with no promotion on my part where he said, Dennis, I want you to preach on a Sunday morning. And uh, to over 1,000 people, he says, you can preach to the most mature person in my church. That was as a baby Christian practically. I didn't seek that out. He sought me out. I sought to serve and honor that man without him knowing it. That, that kind of thinking is lost. But I'll tell you what, him and the fellow I talked about in the beginning from that other church and people with international ministries took me out to lunch and said, Dennis, it's time for you to start your church. That's a little different than the way most people do it, isn't it? Really. Internationally known people took me to lunch to say it's time for you to start because you, they, there was a problem there. I was serving that man and I couldn't start because I'm not going to quit serving until I get a word from God. I thought God gave me a word but I wasn't going to move on it until I got confirmation from those more mature. And I didn't even have to ask them, they sought me out on that. Matter of fact, Sandy Colca, I can still remember that. Sandy Colca, he's going to be on Sid Roth here. He's, he was a guy I kind of grew up with. He was a Jewish believer, and I was a Catholic, and the, between the two of us, we were checking out these Protestants, trying to figure out what the heck they're doing. And, <laughs> and they threw us on TV and radio and everything, him because he was a Jew and me because of my uh, uh, baptism. And, and uh, we were going on and on. And he says, I'm, he gave me $100. He says, God's telling me to do this for you to start your new church. I'm sewn into it. And don't, and I says, but I don't know. And he goes, I know. You're serving the pastor. But he's in this too. And then they took me to lunch. That's almost non-existent nowadays. We, we live in a time when people are afraid that the pastor's in the way of my ministry. The pastor's in the way. Somebody's standing in the way of your ministry. Nobody's ever going to stand in the way of your ministry. Except you. The second thing is there's people trying to go into full-time ministry, but not only are they not getting any confirmation from 
the body from the home church. But secondly, they've got little experience in ministry. Ministry is not knowing your Bible. You can go to Bible school and learn the Bible. That's not ministry. Ministry is people. <laughs> so they have little experience in ministry and even less understanding in what is required. People don't understand what you, I'd say the average person doesn't even know what we go through to set up and tear down in this place. How many hours is our involved? The time, paperwork. We have three ministries. We've got team embassy, full stature ministry. The paperwork is like any other business. Do you know that that's required? You would have to do that. You can't just once a week stand behind a pulpit there's more involved, isn't it? How many have worked administratively in ministries? Yeah. There's a lot to it, isn't it? It's not just... And the other thing that I saw, and this is something that's burdened Jennifer, that's the opposite of what I did. I met with six pastors every year for something like close to 20 years. All of them were my senior. All of them were older. Many of them are with the Lord now. But all of them were older than me. I do not see young people spending time with older mentors. Peers are raising peers. That doesn't work real well. Peers raising peers. I saw that in the city. You know what that was called? A gang. They reestablished. And when they bounce things off of each other, they're going to talk the same language, but that doesn't make it right. The next thing that's missing that could lead us into another gospel. I might even finish this today if I don't get any <laughs> sidetracks. Then Jesus said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up his cross daily. Now I'm going to go way back. This is way before most of your time. There used to be a Catholic priest that was kind of evangelistic on television. Way back. It was called Bishop Sheen. Amen. Anybody ever heard of him? Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Bishop Sheen. He was known for wearing his little Catholic beanie and his big robe, and when he would talk, he would swish the robe like this. He was, I mean, he was made for television. And he'd have a chalkboard. And he'd... But he had an expression that I believe was prophetic. He said, the problem with the church is we have a crossless Christ. You say you love Jesus, but the cross is missing in your life. But then he also said, we have a crossless Christ and a Christless cross. Very profound. Because basically, you can't have a cross without Jesus. And you can't have a Jesus without a cross. you're entering into another gospel when that's the case. Another one, no spirit. For moving in discernment, this is a hard one for me. It's because so many people say things that are scriptural, but God's not in it. And it's like, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? In our next book on the will of God as a river, what we want to teach is every believer can learn to follow flow. Trust in the Lord, that's down here, rest in Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. 
lean not on this. So this is going to tell you things that are not right, isn't it, from time to time. Don't lean on this. Acknowledge. This means be aware of what's going on in your spirit. You have this capacity. You have an anointing. It abides within. You shouldn't have anybody teach you this because the teacher's on the inside. If you will pay attention, he will guide you into all truth. That's how you flow in the river of God's will. Acknowledge is not here. Acknowledge, spirit to spirit, breath to breath. Acknowledge him in all your ways. In other words, you start going this way and, and it goes, eh. what does that tell you? I mean, this is not complicated. It's like a traffic light. You got a red light. That means don't do that, whatever that is. Another one is like, uh, kind of like a caution. That's a yellow light, meaning, eh, might be a good idea, but not now. Learn to do that in a prayer, learn to do that in a house group meeting. Did you ever have somebody that's talking out of turn? They don't know it. If they know it, they're overriding it. But everyone else seems to know it. They're just moving. Red light, green light, yellow light. And by the way, married people, best advice you could ever have. If you think God's telling you to do one thing and your mate's telling you I don't agree, you wait till you either get two red lights or two green lights. <laughs> this is not rocket science. This is basically learning to live from the spirit, from the gut. Not by rules and regulations or by law or by what... And I shouldn't pick on that, but I always had a problem with, what would Jesus do? That can force some people to go up here. It is good to know what Jesus would do scripturally. But don't use that as a criteria because you get back in your head. I want to know what does Jesus want me to do? Not in general, what would he do? You should know in general what you're supposed to do. To know to do and not to do it is sin. All right? So without the Spirit... You end up in the flesh. Here's another one. Without grace. And right now there's two extremes. There's the hyper grace message. That's basically you never have to ask for forgiveness or repentance again because you did it once. I've never seen a move of God. I wonder where those people are going to be when there's a move of God and all of a sudden a holy reverence comes into the room. I wonder if it, Isaiah was on his face. But if you never have to repent or ask for forgiveness again, then the presence of God comes in and it's a reverential fear of the Lord. Where you just go, oh, I, I, I've adapted to that. Yeah. Without grace, only one gospel. I marvel, this is Galatians, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So Jesus said, peace to you, as the Father has sent me. If you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain, they are retained. Go ye that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in his name. We covered that earlier. That's basically forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. The last one, no works. You've got faith, but you don't do nothing. <laughs> faith without works is dead. And when the Lord was training me in the school of the Spirit, he did something that would be helpful for all of you to do. It was certainly helpful for me, so that I wasn't in my mystical union with God, just in my imagination, not really having a real relationship. He basically said, any truth that I reveal to you, any scripture that I reveal to you, any topic that I am teaching you, I'm going to teach you how to cultivate that topic, and then I'm going to have you check yourself to see if there was fruit. In other words, people get revelation all the time, but is that revelation changing you? If it's not changing you, you don't own it. 
It's revelation for information, but there's revelation for transformation, and transformation is more important than information. Next time you get a revelation, apply it to yourself first before you just give it to everybody else. Does it, is it changing you? And if it's changing you, in time, can you look backwards and see, I am different now. I did it with the forgiveness message. At first, I complained to God that I was so messed up in my head that even as a new believer, particularly before I got filled with the Holy Spirit, I said, God, I'm forgiving all day long. I'm tired of this. I have dirty thoughts all day long at work. I'm mad at everybody. I don't like the way anything's done. I forgive, I forgive. I say, God, I got to go to work. I can't keep doing this. Forgive this thing. I'm doing it constantly. I got to think about my machine so I don't cut my hand off when I'm operating my machine. Then I'm, I release forgiveness or that judgment against that machine. But the man and the circumstances and people. But the beauty of it was that I saw that if you continue to practice it, something was changing in me that the forgiveness was not as constant, that I was actually walking in it. I'd blow it, but the blowing it was farther apart. <laughs> That's sanctification. That somehow I was being a partaker, and thank God I didn't give up and quit just because it was so hard at first. It got to be a flow. It got to be even to where I prayed prevenient prayers. You know what a prevenient prayer is? Pray ahead of the devil. I was going, oh God, this is so good. I've been enjoying your presence. I'm praying right now. I release forgiveness. Supernatural intercession is flowing out of me for the next guy that cuts me off the road so I don't react. I was praying ahead of the stuff. I know the stuff that pushed my buttons, and so do you. You know what pushes your buttons. Pray ahead of it. And you know what? You tested by the fruit. You know what I saw? Things that used to devastate me irritated me. Things that used to irritate me didn't bother me anymore. That's proof. That's fruit. You will know them by their fruit, but you should, know, you should be inspecting your own fruit is what God was telling me. I gave you a truth, a revelation. Then I showed you how to cultivate that truth. Now I'm asking you to look in hindsight. Did it do anything in your life or are you just playing church? Are you changed? Are you different? This is not a seeker-friendly church, is it? This is, a, this is a passionate searcher church. I want to do like Jesus to where you feel like you're kicking them out in love. Oh, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. You better think about it. We're not staying in the Holiday Inn, you know. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. We're not going to have anywhere to lay our head. Boy, he wasn't after the numbers, was he? Huh? Or, I too will follow you, but let me first bury my father. You come now. I'll tell you what, it seems like he should have been pushing people away. Huh? Unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh. A lot of them did go away on that one. What's he looking for? I'm looking for people who are going to commit and take up their cross daily, not a mamby-pamby, play church, have a show, and feel good. Basically, God says faith works. Without works, it's dead. But it's expressed through love, and you will identify it by its fruit. God wants to show a better way, and it's with love. He doesn't want us to be bankrupt of love. But basic, I guess we covered about eight or nine areas. If you're into another gospel, it's because there's no forgiveness, no fruit, no love, no lordship, no intimacy, no cross, no spirit, no grace, no works. I even had one person comment on Facebook one time. Somebody quoted me on my definition of grace, and they're going, and this is supposed to be a teacher. I don't think that's a proper definition of grace. Don't get your theology from Facebook, please. <laughs> the definition of grace, there's various definitions. But the one that, that, that is the most livable for me 
is grace is the personal presence of Jesus in me. The personal, enabling or empowering me to be all that he called me to be and to do all that he called me to do. Grace is for obedience. And before you call yourself a teacher, study to show yourself approved. Really would be a good idea. <laughs> and bounce some of your things off. Because what we have is rather than having an experiential theology, uh, my spiritual father's 90, I think he's 94 right now. I'm not sure. But anyway, he said, if I had it to do over again, I would teach people theology. He was a brilliant theologian. I would teach them enough theology to live life effectively. A lot of what's been taught is really not essential. Interesting, but not essential. Teach them how to live in victory. Give them enough theology to know that they have to have intimacy with God and what have you. So Father, we just thank you that to make ready a people prepared for the coming of the Lord, we cannot have uh, easy grace. It's something that we just slide into. We need to really let the Holy Spirit see, is there, is there any leaning in our life toward another gospel, which isn't really a gospel? Any leaning in us to override the basic fundamentals cause me to live a forgiveness lifestyle because then I'm at least walking in the light as he is in the light, and if I need more light, he will shine it upon my heart through the face of Jesus Christ. If I need corrected, I want to feel the love of God in the correction. I want to, I want to be able to feel that I have not distanced myself in any way from him, that I might practice his presence. And Father, we just pray for those that have isolated themselves. They're too busy. or just caught up in too many choices. I like that word Andrew gave one time when we were sharing. I just loved it, it really went right in. He said there's a solution to too many choices though. That may be a problem in our culture right now. People have so many choices. Think about Bible times. You grew up with mom and dad, the family, and you did the chores. You probably took the trade on. You didn't have a lot of choices. You didn't travel all around the world and entertainment and skydive and, and jump off cliffs and, uh, and go to this country and that country and this country and that country. Wonderful entertainment. What did they do? They were faithful. And what we're seeing is with faithfulness, there's fruit. And we're seeing the lack of fruit now because of too many choices. But the redemptive side of that, what if in the midst of all those choices, you choose Jesus as your first love and let everything else fall to the side? Nothing is going to take the place of his lordship and his preeminence in my life. What if you made that with all the other choices? Would that honor God? It certainly would. How many want to make that choice today? You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit 
and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.